Hi everyone, I know it's been a little bit of time since my last video, so I thought I'd give a bit of an update on how things are progressing with the Ultima. I haven't been sitting idle, but I have been pretty busy as well, and some of the things that I have been doing haven't been great to video. Uh, I'm holding a dog toy today because my dog's annoying the shit out of me with it, and this is the only way I can command his attention. But uh, we'll be running over the carbon fiber airbox. I've got the lower section fabricated there. Uh, I needed to do that before I fitted up the motor because it would be very hard for me to do that with the motor fitted up, and I expect that the motor's going to sit in position for a while because I'm going to be building the wiring loom. Uh, I also marked out the upper and lower bulkhead sections so that I can just make sure as soon as I fit the motor that everything's going to fit and package well, uh, particularly when you start to, I guess, divert from what the factory setup is. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not going to run into issues. Uh, just off the top of my head, I need to fit an oil accumulator, which is not a typical fitment to these. Uh, I also need to make sure that my electric water pump, which again is not a typical fitment, uh, won't foul on things like the uh, low pressure fuel pump in these cars. So it's just making sure all those things work out well. Uh, we also get the seats fitted, so I'll show you how I do that. Um, just give you a few tips there in terms of when you're mounting things, particularly to uh, sort of like lower gauge sheet metal. Um, and you can also see here that I've got the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's uh, on the wheels now, because uh, I expect that pretty much once this motor goes in, um, it'll be a matter of building the wiring loom, and um, then it can pretty much be a roller. And uh, we should be able to, shouldn't be too far away from firing it up, to be honest. Uh, and speaking of which, as soon as I am able to fire this up, my plan is pretty much to sort of loosely fit uh, the, the rear clam, uh, the front clip, uh, and the side pods, and then I'll be taking it and trying to just get a base tune into it, uh, a tune that's going to be suitable for me to get through emissions. Um, and just make sure that everything is working as it should and make sure that there's absolutely no leaks, these types of things. Because obviously, uh, once you seal things up, if you need to get access to wiring looms or you need to get access to a heater pipe or something like that, it is infinitely more, I guess, painful and you don't want to have to do anything destructive like drill out a thousand rivets, get all the shavings into the chassis and this sort of stuff. Uh, so that's why I'm going to go and verify all that sort of stuff, run it up on the dyno, uh, get everything working and then uh, we'll go from there and make sure and do a final fitment of everything and, and get the body on. Uh, anyhow, look, let's get into it. As always, any questions, leave them down below. Any comments, uh, good or bad, always happy to, to receive constructive uh, criticism, send them there. And you can, of course, always follow on Instagram. Uh, you kind of get some more real-time updates, I guess, and, and sort of a bit of other material, uh, which is uh, 105 Motorsport. Uh, anyhow, thanks very much for watching. Hope everyone's well. Right, so I'm just going to try and video this. I don't know how well it's going to sort of show up. But what I can do is when I'm actually using the angle gauge here and I get it lined up so that it is flat on this trumpet and flat on the opposing trumpet, the actual center line of where the airbox would sit is actually offset to the side, which to me suggests that uh, basically both of these sets of, uh, of intake runners don't actually line up. So the center line of the airbox wouldn't be in the center. And that's why uh, fabricating the airbox has turned out to maybe be a, a slightly better idea than, than just trying to go off the drawings, the manufacturing drawings. So I can see here, look, it's about 190 degrees. There's obviously going to be a bit of flexing in this airbox. Uh, so I need to be conscious of that when I reinforce it. Uh, we don't want it to flex and then create a, a high or low point, which is actually going to pop away from the air filter and give a bypass on it. So it's just, there's going to be a bit of mucking around here. We're going to need to check it along all of the runners and, and fabricate it and sort of try and take, there'll be some mucking around for sure. So we can see this is how the bottom of the filter box is starting to uh, work together. What I'm trying to do is maximize the distance between the bottom of the filter and the top of the trumpets so that I can ensure that we're getting a fairly even flow of air to each of the cylinders. Uh, obviously this height is something that we're going to need to contend with in terms of how much clearance we have from the top of the motor uh, to the bottom of the clamshell when it's closed. Uh, these filters are sized off Canaan's website. Uh, I'll put a link down to that in the description so you can have a look for yourself. Uh, this is heavily oversized versus pretty much everything else that's on the market. The reason I wanted to do that is if you're reducing the airflow across the, the filter, you'll reduce the pressure drop across the filter. A free flowing intake is going to help performance at uh, especially, you know, different parts of the RPM range. And uh, I thought that there was some good consideration here for if start part of these filters are clogged at all uh, in terms of maintaining performance. You'll note on K&N's website, for example, they actually say a W filter size for off-road racing. Um, that's just to account for that clogged filter factor. Uh, otherwise, uh, there was nothing made for these ITBs to start with, uh, so we're going to have to make this this mould and then uh, cast a carbon fibre uh, intake plenum from there. Uh, the idea with this is that uh, obviously these will sit flat, but we'll have a, a scoop here that follows the, the line of the bottom of the clam and it goes directly to the roof scoop to inhale the air. That will have the uh, advantage of one always feeding cold air straight to the top of the motor, which is something that I think is really important if you want to maintain horsepower as you're using the car. Uh, some of these terrible intakes you see, 
or even some of the ones that you see advertised with great horsepower figures don't take heatsink or anything like that into a consideration which if you're racing it's great that you've got a 700 horsepower motor but there's no point having a 700 horsepower motor if it actually only produces 500 for you know actual normal conditions uh, so there's lots of sort of dyno great dyno figures but not ones that actually produce uh, horsepower all the time the other thing will be is that uh, with these cars just Directing this fresh air straight into the top of the motor here will uh, obviously give us an amazing sound. We'll start to hear, even at, uh, say, low RPM, when you snap the throttle open, you'll see the, uh, you, you'll actually hear this starting to suck air from the top of the roof scoop directly next to your head. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, anyhow, now we need to enclose this in. Uh, obviously, make sure that none of these angles change. I've m marked all of the cutouts for the the uh, trumpets, uh, so we'll need to cut them out later, but I'll cast the carbon around the, the mold first, and then uh, I'll actually cut through the bottom plate here and the carbon, which is uh, molded around the outside to start with. I might even, uh, look, depending on how, how keen I feel, I've got some uh, tooling gel coat to actually turn this into a, a mold uh, to, I guess, reproduce this down the track if I, if I feel inclined or if there's someone else that uh, has a similar setup or the same setup and wants to, wants to do this. So I could always, uh, I guess, share some, of the, share some of the love with that one. Whilst we have the opportunity here, I thought I'd just show the side pod installed. Obviously, there's a, a bit of the uh, sound insulation that we're going to be putting on the side, just a bit of the sound deadener to add some, some mass to this side pod. Uh, you can also see here uh, where we're going to be running the wiring loom between the ECU and also the back there. So you can see it's all ready to go there with all of its zip ties and, uh, and appropriate clips. So we're going to use rope to simulate the, the path there and use that for measuring out our wiring loom. Uh, and we can see it's going to feed back there into the engine compartment uh, between the fuel tank and the side pod. Uh, we've also got the seat installed. It was quite painful to get the measurements down onto the floor uh, to replicate the, the mounting points of the seat. Uh, the reason being is because of this tapered section of the floor pan, uh, it actually measures from the side to the hole. And if you can imagine, this is 50 mil higher than what the, what the base plate is here. So when you're trying to use something to measure it off the side, you've sort of got that offset that makes it difficult to, to get the measurement. But we got there in the end. Uh, I measured about 25 times, as you can imagine, and it all bolted up well. We can also see that we've got the mounting points here for the anti-submarine strap for the harness and also the mounting points for the fire extinguisher. Now, one thing when you are putting any bolter joint in place, there are two main value modes for a bolter joint. One is shear, which is basically why you select a certain uh, size of bolt, you know, M8, M10, whatever, which is the, the diameter of the, the threaded part, if you want to see that there, or the shank. Um, and the other one is tear out. And what that is, is where you have a bolt to join in a panel like this, for example, and it actually pulls out of the floor in that event. So say you have a rollover and the seat will actually pull out of the floor. So to combat that, what they do is you run a reinforcement plate. Uh, that one there is an FIA uh, certified one, which is a 50 by 50 by, I think, two mil plate uh, with a 9 uh, nut. You can make these yourself. They're just, they're just a mild steel joint. I would recommend just running a little bit of silicon when you put these in a floor, uh, whether you're mounting a, a seat belt mounting point or whether you're actually using them to bolt in a cage uh, they're the same type of thing uh, just check with your local regulations though so in Australia we require a 75 by 50 mil plate uh, whereas these are only 50 by 50 but it's important to do these things now because if you ever want to race a car in in say a particular class of racing you need to be aware of that uh, the seat mounting points here obviously I've just used a washer there for the moment but I will be putting in a larger washer to increase the the surface area the purchase on that and just to explain how that that operates uh, the two I suppose uh, value modes if you want to use a bolted joint here uh, through two panels is you're going to have uh, the shear load which is what we were basically talking about where you have say this panel moving in this direction uh, and whatever you're bolting it to moving in the other direction and the effective area that you're using to prevent that shear is that is the size of the bolt now the other one is tear out uh, which is where we have the bolt force going in that direction or the opposite direction and it's going to pull the bolter joint through this panel here. Now if you think about it, if you were just to use the nut and bolt, the area that you're using to resist that is just the area of the nut, the projected area of the nut there 
and obviously that only gives you a small amount of area here as particularly if this is thin sheet metal uh, to prevent that pulling through so what you do is you put the reinforcement plate that increases the effective area resisting that pull through and and stops that from happening it's a very simplistic way to just say look you can just do this with a, a 50 by 50 mil plate or or a 50 by 75 mil plate because what you're doing is you're you're sort of using absolutely no regard for what you're actually bolting it into whether that be you know two mil or, or 0.6 mil plate even uh, so it is just something to be aware of uh, when you're mounting up your harness pay particular attention to uh, the mounting points so those anti-submarine straps need to be a certain uh, distance back and they run under the seat and then back through here and that stops you in the event of a crash because your body movement say you have a head on is heading this direction it stops you slipping out under your belts and ending up in the footwell of your car uh, believe it or not that does actually happen and that's why these things are so important uh, when you're setting up your harness that'll be the basically the the first uh, adjustment you make is to the, the anti-submarine belt um, then you'll also have the waist belt, which will uh, obviously hold you in place, is tip, sort of typical to a lap sash that you get there uh, that holds your waist down. And you want these two to be relatively tight. Uh, and the reason that you want that to happen is if this creeps up too far in the event of a crash, it'll destroy your insides and kill you. Uh, and the last thing that you're gonna do up is obviously your shoulder straps, which ideally would go over hands, a head and neck restraint system. They're very cheap. If you're racing and not running them, you need to reconsider your life. Uh, but they will run over the top here and you'll plug them in last and pull them down, uh, as you'd see in most videos. Uh, and that, that's the final point of adjustment. Uh, you will notice when you start using a harness yourself that they are a pain in the ass. So guys who think that they should run them in road cars, just, just don't do it. It's a pain. You're better off with a, with a standard seat belt for anything that you can use quite regularly. Uh, in the ultimate, given that I'm not going to be driving it every day, uh, it's not that type of car. It's not a particular issue. Uh, it is a concession that I'm also sort of used to making. One particular product that Sparco make that I'm actually a big fan of at the moment is they do an endurance type belt and they're designed to have quick dri driver changes. And what they do is they have Velcro tabs here and stuff. So when you get out of the, get out of your harness, you can actually sort of pull the, the shoulder straps up and position them so they just Velcro in, in place and it saves it getting all tangled up like spaghetti when you get in and out. It's designed in that application to get fast driver changes for GT cars, but in terms of actual road use, it actually makes them far more usable. So that's something I'd, I'd probably like to consider for, for the Ultima or, or any of my other cars in the future. But just one to be aware of. Um, and also if you don't have them adjusted, properly you'll probably crush your nuts so um that's that's never very fun uh, unless you're trying to uh, avoid having kids and just on that it seems like an opportune time to talk about bolts now i know this seems like a boring thing but there is actually a little bit to it uh, we can see here that you end up with the, quite a range of bolts and obviously the, the default thing would be just to use high tensile bolts for everything uh, downside being is that their cost is relatively high and also uh, it's not always the best option to use a high tensile bolt because you may want to engineer in or the best the best designs always have a failure point and it's a lot easier to replace a two dollar bolt and have something fail in the correct way as the thing from just running high tensile bolts everywhere so you can see that there's a bit of a selection now i've got this uh, table here which i found that was quite useful this just talks about the different styles of grading for bolts uh, you can see here that on sae which is uh for everyone who's born this century apart from the americans um you grade up from basically no markings are the poor end of the scale and maximum markings is the great end of the scale. Uh, then we have socket head cap screws. Uh, we can see here that for metric equivalent, you're looking at sort of an 8.8 .8 is about a grade 5 bolt, 10.9 is a grade 8, and 12.9 uh, is sort of a bit better than an Allen head uh, cap screw bolt. Aside from that, you need to look at which way you're going to lock them in place. Uh, here we've got just a couple of examples. Uh, you've got your basic grade, then you've got a, an SAE class 7, 8.8. Uh, .8. This one here is actually stamped with 10.9, uh, so that would be equivalent to our class 8, SAE class 8. And we've got a cap head screw there. Uh, there's also bolts which generally at the higher end of thing will have a uh, chamfered sort of connection between the bolt head and the shaft. Uh, that just uh, basically sharp corners uh, propagate, propagate stress. Uh, so on the best bolts, they'll actually have a little chamfer there or radius on the inside. Uh, in that particular case, you almost always need to use a, uh, a washer when you're using that type of bolt. Uh, sorry if the rain's a bit noisy there in the background. Uh, and ideally in most applications, you want to use a, a nylock type nut where it's not high temperature. If it is high temperature, then you've got really no option but to have some sort of mechanical locking mechanism. Uh, we can see here that there's actually a couple of nuts that have uh, some serration that'll lock it in place or you can use uh, just a spring washer or something along those lines. Um, 
when you are torquing things, uh, there are a few different things to consider. Torque wrenches themselves are generally not 100% accurate, so you need to learn to get a bit of a feel for them and understand uh, the way that they operate. Uh, you'll also see in lots of uh, sort of like the more critical applications, they'll actually talk about uh, doing the bolt up tight and then it'll be so many rotations which uh, equates to bolt stretch which is actually internal stress on the bolt and that uh, that has to do with its its sort of ideal torque value. Um, we can see here that you end up collecting uh, literally just like thousands of different kinds if you are interested in making sure that uh, you have the right bolt for the right application. Uh, now when you do lock them in place if you have dissimilar metals you probably almost certainly want to be looking at uh, using um, something like anti-seize, copper or nickel anti-seize or whatever it is depending on the application. Uh, if it is a high temperature situation you may want to use just some red Loctite. Uh, blue Loctite is basically the type of, and we can see a serrated washer there for mechanical locking. Uh, blue Loctite is basically for lower temperature applications or ones which you may want to get undone without having to use uh, sort of heavy duty machinery. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of that at the back of the car here. In my other toolbox. Sorry about this. Uh, we can see there that's a red Loctite and that's the blue Loctite. If you want to think about it this way, red equals hot, blue equals more mild. In fact, I think that's actually red Loctite in a blue bottle. What kind of dick at Permatex did that? I don't know, but uh, there would be some blue Loctite floating around and there's your copper anti copper anti-seize grease. So, uh, especially for stuff like uh, brake sliding bolts, if you've got a, a, a single-sided uh, caliper or or that sort of thing, they're particularly useful. Um, I also use just a bit of that anti-seize with anything that I'm putting into, say, an alloy block. Um, and obviously, in that sense, you're better off making sure that you use zinc-plated uh, fixing hardware or stainless steel, ideally, uh, which would just help that corrosion and probably... Sorry about that. Um, try and help it, uh, I guess, seizing in the long term uh, through corrosion. Uh, otherwise, I think there was one thing which I noticed in this that was actually quite useful. Uh, there's all the different torque values for different styles, uh, different sizes of threads. Um, it did give a pretty good useful thing where if you are using just a, you know, a mild steel boat that, bolt that's uncoated, you basically would need to increase your torque values by about 15%. Uh, and if you're using any sort of Loctite or anti seize, it'll provide a lubrication to the thread, uh, particularly with ARP studs and that sort of thing when you're building engines. Uh, you need to make sure that you use that lock, that uh, thread sealant because it actually has a very large impact on the uh, final torque values. And this one here is just suggesting it's about 20% uh, as a rule of thumb. So anyway, look, that's that's a crash course in bolts. Uh, it's certainly not not a comprehensive look at it, but you can see there, there are a whole different range of them that you can choose from. Uh, get yourself a decent torque wrench and don't throw it around the workshop. Uh, I don't actually think that they, they, like these are either underused or completely overused. I see everyone using a torque wrench uh, at the circuit for doing almost up uh, almost every single bolt, uh, which is not always necessary, but certainly for the critical things, buy a decent torque wrench, uh, look after it, leave it in its case when it's not being used, uh, and don't drop it 500 times, and then when you do need to use it, it'll be quite accurate. Otherwise, you'll be screwing together an engine or doing something that is actually critical and have no idea. Slowly but surely marking out the rear bulkhead panel here. Uh, it's been a bit of a pain because I know I spoke about it in an earlier vi uh, video, but the, the drilling of this by the factory and the body prefit wasn't wasn't exact. So I'm going to have to just sort of slightly over drill these holes and then run a washer on them, which isn't the end of the world. Uh, but I've got all of the po points marked out. There's a diagram here that the factory provide. Obviously you need to look through this and look at your specific application. So I don't have heater hoses, so I don't require any of those fitments. Uh, I've got a mounting here for the high pressure fuel pump, for example. But because I'm gonna be running the electric water pump that's gonna be down in that position, I can't really fit any of this off until I basically mark it all up in position. And then I'm gonna to need to install this, put the motor in, measure up all of my wiring loom, pull everything out again, then do the final drilling. I really wish I'd, uh, I'd thought about this uh, to some extent, even for drilling some of the holes uh, before I installed that panel initially. Uh, it was something that obviously wasn't in the instruction manual, but looking at this, if I could have drilled all the possible holes I needed to drill in this panel before it went in place, it's just that little bit neater. Whereas now when I'm gonna be drilling through, uh, obviously, I'm going to be drilling through the panel and then potentially into a bit of the insulation. There'll be a bit of swarf and stuff. It just would have been a little bit nicer to do that. So, it, you know, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a, an iterative process. You're never going to get that 100% right on every build, uh, but you live and you learn. And they're, they're just little things to 
I guess, be as conscious as you possibly can of uh, when you're building a car. And in particular, you know, if you built one twice, I always say you're going to build it better. And I, I reckon for me, they're, they're the types of things that uh, touch wood I don't run into major problems with, but I, I'm always looking to try and perfect those things. Now, I won't need these mountings up here because I'm not running a, a dry sump, but I will be running my oil accumulator. So I'm going to be mounting that up in a, in a similar position, which will be on the top left there, which is sort of where the, where the dry sump tank norm, normally sits on the car. Uh, it is worthwhile noting though as well that uh, I'll need to make sure that that actually has appropriate insulation because you're going to have your headers running out both sides of the engine here and getting a lot of a lot of heat into a pressurized vessel obviously does well to to build the pressure inside it and obviously if, if that gets too hot it's going to explode uh, you can see the harness mounting points there that i was sort of uh alluding to in terms of positioning for the harness earlier uh, if that will focus uh, and you'll see that the alignment of those relative to the seats and the reason that you can't just buy ebay seats but you need actually certified seats is so that those harness straps will run through and across your shoulders uh in the correct position if you don't get those angles right and i i've seen every harness i've ever bought and i've bought probably 15 of them now uh, or more uh, it will come with a diagram for this uh, you'll see that they actually need to just make sure they're positioned as they come back through the seat there and over your shoulder so that in in a crash they don't slip off your shoulder and not do their job uh, now these positions of these mounting are also why you should uh, go to a reputable cage manufacturer and make sure that that stuff is is uh, in the correct position as it comes back as well um, just to, like little things are important the thing about safety is is that uh, that like these are almost mandatory or fairly simple things to do for cars that get you get used for performance driving uh, and I see so many of them out there that just aren't aren't used properly which is kind of crazy because you have all of these requirements and there's always uh, what do you say stewards working around checking on this stuff but uh, at the end of the day you're responsible for your own safety and and you need to make sure that you're going to put yourself in the best position should the worst worst case happen uh, that you're not going to hurt yourself I mean I I destroyed a car a couple of years ago in Targa uh, and thankfully my old man and I we wrote the car off uh, it wasn't it, it wasn't an issue we both hopped away and i think the the best medicine that we had was probably about the 25 beers each that we drank that night to uh talk about how it totally wasn't my fault for the entire thing